Got an Akai GX600 DB reel to reel in for service. This is one of the few units that has Dolby noise reduction on it. In fact, it's the only unit that I've ever seen that has Dolby noise reduction. Complaint on this one is it's going slow. So we're gonna have to uh, take a look at this one and see what's causing the problem. Should be a good one, let's check it out. This one would be from about 1975 and would have been made right around the time when reel to reel was starting to fade in the limelight for, for home recording. This one supported the seven and a half or seven and ten and a half inch reels. It's a three head glass machine, which is fine with your conventional tapes, but uh, sticky, shed, sticky shed tapes syndrome is certainly going to be problematic on a unit like this. Complaint on this one is that it slows down. So let's let it run and see what happens. It's more than likely it's going to be the run capacitor is getting weak for the induction motor because this is this is an induction motor type unit so let's uh, play it and we'll see what happens the thing I am going to have to do is clean the controls the controls are pretty dirty on here but uh, I just had the other tape play through I'm just gonna play a longer tape on here now I should actually go get my uh, ten and a half inch tape and let that play on here and uh, let this thing play for a while and let it get warm and then we'll uh, see what happens with the speed. But so far it's been playing okay. But uh, typically what happens is with when the cap capacitor gets weak, um, they start to slow down as you, as you move through the tape. You know what? It's not the motor slowing down, it's tape slippage. So either we don't have enough tension on the pinch roller or just the pinch roller itself is, um, oh, <laughs> here's our problem. This bearing is seizing up. Oh, this is going to be, I, I thought I was going to have to change a, a run capacitor, but there's lots of torque on the motor. The motor's fine. It's just that the, the bearing <laughs> is seized up on the pinch roller. Good. This should be a nice, relatively easy fix. Now, no, I'm not just going to lubricate the pinch roller, although I am going to do this to start. But we're going to pull this thing apart and lubricate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yum. The grease in here is dried up. The oil is dried up completely. You can see it. Yummy. We're going to give this unit a lubrication. I'll take the unit apart and we'll lubricate all the bearings in it because it needs it. It needs it. stuck on there good okay here's the problem with this one as you can see the lubricant has completely dried up and I would gather that all the lubricants on all the uh, all the pivot points need to be done so we'll be taking the front off this one the uh, grease is all dried up also This thing sounds like it's got uh, some capacitor or some transistors that are getting noisy. So it's got a few problems. Let's start by lubing the uh, bearings up on this thing. So we'll just clean the old grease off with some isopropyl alcohol. 99%. The same with the the bearing in the actual pinch roller itself.
Yeah, that that noise is in both the monitor and the uh, or the source and the tape mode. Sounds like it could be in the Dolby circuit. So we'll put a drop of oil. That's enough on the uh, the bearing. There, that spins a little better. We'll put the the nut back on. For now, this is going to have to come off again when I take it apart to lubricate everything. I just want to see if the speed is going to be better now. That's a little better. I try to slow it down by hand. That noise only seems to appear in the right channel when the Dolby noise reduction switch is on. And also only when I've got the gain cranked all the way up, which will give me volume like uh, that. This has got an output level on it, and if I crank it all the way up, to max and I turn on the Dolby noise reduction I can hear a bit of a bit of cracking in the background how come every time I go to make a video somebody has to start up a lawnmower it never fails anytime I go to work it doesn't matter what day of the week I go to work as soon as I turn on the microphone Somebody's got to start a lawnmower up, and now I got to wait for them to finish, otherwise, I have noise all through my video. So, I'm just going to remove all the screws. Take the front cover off so that I can lubricate the pivot points and um, clean the controls. And then we'll investigate where that noisy transistor is uh, creating all the, the problems. I don't have a blank check book on this one to do a full restoration. So we have to do what we can do here on the budget that I have. To open this up we have to take out all the screws to remove all the levers and so forth
pull the faceplate off the bench, you got to remove the bottom cover because there are a couple screws that are in the bottom here that hold the faceplate on. This is to access the controls to clean them. And to access the top piece, I think I gotta take I gotta take the top off as well, or at least the sides off of it as well. Sides, top and bottom cover removed to access the last two screws to remove the top or the face bezel. Unscrew the tape stabilizer and lift it off. A lot of work needed to get to the mechanism just so that we can lubricate these bearings because they do get gummed up and when they get gummed up you have problems so first I'm going to clean the switches and the controls that are accessible from the bottom here Yes, that's a chatty cat. Okay, that, that uh, control should be should be clean. I'm just uh, cleaning the switches and controls here that I can get at from the bottom. And it's awkward to get into this thing too. The way they've got the switches and the controls placed, they're hard to get at. So can't really show you easily, but they're they're underneath here, up there. dried up on so I can get into this one with a drop of oil and lubricate that one without actually having to take it apart any further than that because this one's actually accessible. It hasn't uh, gummed up to the point where the existing lubricant has turned to cement or to glue. So that was the one that I was most concerned about more than anything because this is the, the pinch roller is the one that usually gums up more than, than the other ones. Most of the other mechanisms are, are quite loose fitting like this one here and uh, they aren't on a pivot. This one here should also be lubricated. That's on a pivot. Again, I can get at that one though without having to take it apart too far. Maybe pop the, the C-clip. This one's a C-clip, not an E-clip. Maybe pop that C-clip or some people call it a Jesus clip. Because that's what you say when it flies off and you lose it. Or when you poke your finger in the process and draw blood. Actually, I can get in here without doing too much to it. Get down to here. Down to the other side there. C-clip as opposed to the other one which is an E-clip. Same with this one.
bearing should be lubricated on this flywheel. This is just a free spinning flywheel to stabilize the tape and that needs to be cleaned. It's pretty dirty. We'll clean that first and then uh, try and get some lube in that bearing. It's turning freely so it's not a, a serious problem at this point. But for basic maintenance, won't hurt to clean it and get a drop of oil into it. You think this thing was dirty? Yes, I would say it was dirty. Very dirty. The heads are also pretty rough shape. They're uh, pretty coated with crap too, so we'll clean them up. Well, I've got it on its back. I think this machine has been cleaned in 45 years. Yeah, uh, that's what came off the head. Or the heads. I'm going to get a drop of oil. Into the uh, bearing just by got a drop of oil on the end of the screwdriver here. Get right into the bearing. There it goes. So that should, gravity should take that oil down into that bearing. It's not gummed up or anything. You can see how effortlessly, effortlessly it turns. So I don't think we have to worry too much about that one. One thing I do want to check is the positioning of the uh, solenoid switch. There's a little switch down here for when the solenoid is engaged it reduces the current through it. And it is working, it's fine. I'll show you the switch at a different angle here. This is the switch here. It has a, a lever on When the uh, solenoid pulls in the tape bar, the, 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 the tape release bars that pull the tape away from the head activate the switch. You can see it. What this switch does when the switch closes is, or actually the switch opens, the switch is closed now and when the capstan or when the pinch roller is engaged, when the solenoid pulls in, that switch opens and what it does is it puts a resistor in series with the coil to reduce the current going through the coil. If that switch doesn't open, then you'll end up with your uh, your solenoid will overheat and burn out. We've seen that before on other ones. That's where the switch is on this particular model. Of course, the other solenoid uh, current reduction switch is this one here, and this is for the brake solenoid. So when the brake solenoid is engaged like that, that um, opens this switch. So what it's there for is when you press, press, press the button, the solenoid gets full current, 120 volts or whatever it's running on. And then once the switch opens, it's fed through a resistor in series, which reduces the current because the not as much current is required to maintain the plunger to hold it in than it is to actually activate it. So these ones, you got to make sure that when the plunger is in, that these switches are being actually activated because if they're not you'll end up with a burned out coil and these parts would be very difficult to find today on a 45 year old machine the tape counter belt looks to be in good shape in fact this machine actually doesn't look to be in too bad a shape um, other than it's got a bit of noise on that right channel that we're going to have to investigate but i just wanted to lubricate i'm going to lube this one as well not that it needs it but We'll put a drop of oil on these pivot points here. 
and of course into the, the pivot point below. So we'll just soak some up here on the screwdriver and go into the point down below. You don't need much, right? The lubricant is better to have too little than too much. Okay, that's the basic lubricant or lubrication of of the uh, should be the switch. The switch here over here. This is the the stop lever. When the tape drops, that activates that switch again. Nothing gummed up there, so we don't need to worry about that. Lubricating the capstan um, bearing itself. There's a there's a little oiler hole right there. Right at the top there that you can put an oiler down and drop a bit of oil into the bearing. I just put a drop of oil on the end of my dental pick because I don't have one of those oilers that have got the the um, I don't have one of those oilers that have got the long extension so I just do it that way. That gets oil down where it belongs into the bearing. Again, it doesn't take much, just a drop, that's all you need. Too much oil is worse than not enough. Particularly true in cars. Overfill your crankcase and see what happens. Ask anyone who's done it and ask them what happened. Blow all the seals out on your motor for one. And you'd be paying your mechanic a big hefty bill. Okay, I'm going to put the top piece back on here, put the pinch roller back on, and then we can investigate as to why this thing is noisy. And there goes the lawnmower again. I should point out there is one screw that is longer, and that's for this. That's for this piece here. So that goes on. That arm goes on, and then there's a. That goes on top. And then this longer screw is the one that attaches that, I think. Pretty sure it was the longer screw.
problem with the plastic knobs is that the the plastic breaks free from the metal so these have to be glued back in place if they do which this one they have the glue goes in the base here and then you push the piece back down and that will let it dry and then it'll properly control the control once it sets up I hope the neighbors not paying these people by the hour because they've been there about four hours today cutting their grass and blowing all the leaves around okay all the knobs back on all is good now I can start to troubleshoot why this thing is noisy so here's the back of the unit and a bunch of boards on this these connectors sometimes um, need to be cleaned up usually you can just unplug them and reseat them and it will break any uh, oxidation that's on here but it doesn't hurt to give them a shot of cleaner or wipe them down with cleaner in this case I'm just going to put some deoxid on here so I'm going to grab my can of, of uh, D100 and we'll get those connectors clean Normally that's all that's needed to be done. Um, on this unit here, uh, some people like to change all the caps on it again. If, uh, if this, there was no limit as to what was being spent on this, we could spend, literally, you could spend hundreds of dollars changing all the caps. As you can imagine, one of these units is not the easiest thing to work on because these boards are all held down. They've got, all got wires going to them. So to take the boards out to change all the capacitors on it is a real a real chore. To do any work on these things is a real chore. But uh, let's see if we can figure out where that uh, noise is coming from. Check out the belt. Capstan belt's in good shape. I have lots of, lots of torque there. This is the capstan motor. The belt is in good shape. You can see there. Nothing slipping. Uh, the cap that would have failed if it was the motor that was slowing down, I believe it's this one right here on this one. It's like a 2 microfarad, 250 volt, and that is it there. That that one, lower the camera down so you guys can see it. If the motor loses torque, that's the run capacitor. Lots of torque. Yeah, so there's no no problem there, but that's the one that's going to fail, if any. If, if the motor is running slow, that's the cap there to change. It's an oil filled 250 volt AC capacitor, two microfarads. I don't know whether there'd be any PCBs in that one or not from, this was manufactured in 1975. Some of these oil filled caps will have PCBs in them, so you have to be careful. And this is certainly around the era when they were starting to ban a lot of those chemicals. So this may or may not have PCBs in it. But you have to treat these things as if they do. So they should be disposed of correctly if you're changing it out. Now I've had this one fail on mine. I had to change it on mine. But mine actually had two. Mine, mine had a dual because it had, uh, for 50 hertz, it had, uh, I think it was a two and a three. And when you switched your, it had a line frequency switch on the back. When you switched it, it switched from one to the other and I just replaced it with a single a single cap so if I switch mine to 50 Hertz the motor actually stops because I just put a single one in in place of it and that was a long time ago so everything's nice and quiet until I turn on the Dolby switch and now I'm hearing all kinds of noise we have a bad transistor in this thing for sure So I'm going to dig up, I'm going to dig up the schematic and we'll look. Damn phone's interfering with this thing. 
was going through the uh, schematic here to figure out exactly how things are interconnected. Everything goes through the Dolby board. Whether it's on or off, it goes through the Dolby board, but it takes a separate path through it. Damn phones interfere with everything. Just identifying the boards here. This is obviously the record board because it's got the record switches on it. Uh, this one's a playback board, it looks like. It's a playback board because it has the two transformers on it, one for the left and one for the right, T1 and T2. That's those. And uh, the Dolby board must be one of the boards on the top. See, nothing on these old units is identified, see. You know, look at the manual and go through there to figure out where things are. Okay, the unit has two Dolby boards. The one on the right is the record Dolby board. This is the playback. That's the one I'm interested in. I definitely see noise there. So the problem's on this board here. That's the one that's got a faulty transistor or something. This would be a perfect opportunity if I had cold spray. I could just give the transistors a shot, cold spray. But unfortunately, I don't have any cold spray at the moment. I haven't had any for a while. Something in here is bad. A transistor, more than likely, has gone, has gone noisy. Maybe able to hit it with some heat, make it worse. But uh, it's going to be a transistor in here. Sometimes I can just wiggle them a bit with my finger and it'll snap and crackle. You can sometimes get lucky. It's a bad junction. You can move it and physically it will get noisier. So the boards do come out for service. I got the power off now so don't worry about it touching anything. Wires are not very long, so you kind of kind of work on them. But they do they do lift out. There's only three screws that hold the board in, and it just clips in on the back side. So I'm just going to uh, do a visual inspection here and see whether we can isolate which one of these transistors is causing the problem. Now, usually when they go bad, they go thermally bad. So I can heat the thing up put my soldering iron near the transistor and if it's gone thermal the noise is going to get a lot louder when I get near it with a hot soldering iron. You've seen me do that before on other videos. I'm just going to put some paper or something in between the bottom of the board and the chassis so that there's no chance of me touching anything and causing anything to go pop. Well, it's a good idea to insulate if you're going to be working on circuit boards that are out. And I got to be careful on this thing because even though this board only operates at 24 volts, there is main voltage on this board here. So I got to kind of keep that in mind. So this is just going to protect the board so it doesn't touch anything while I'm working on it. And then I'm just going to turn on the power and listen to that noise and uh, just bring my soldering iron close to some of these transistors and see whether the noise gets louder or softer because it could be thermal either way. When you heat it up, generally you'll cause the plastic to expand. Typically what causes this noise is the junction on the silicon is uh, failing where it's connected to the outside world. So typically you, you can, by means of heating and cooling, determine which component is bad. And you've seen me do that before. I did that on a preamp that was noisy uh, a while back. So let's turn it on and listen to all the noise and see whether the noise gets louder when I get something hot near it or if the noise goes away cold spray is good for this you can thermally shock it with cold but I don't have any so heat is the next best thing
usually when you get it, it'll get really loud or get really quiet. What happened there? Is that getting louder? Actually, this might be the left channel. The, the two boards in here might be Dolby Record and Dolby Playback. I forgot about that. This is probably the one here. This is the one that's noisy. Let me just clip on here. because There's two different test points. Let's see if this is the left channel. Or this should be the... This one should be the left channel. If I bring my... Something near the... Yeah, that's the left channel. Okay. So this is left channel. This is right channel. But it, this is the playback board. The other board over here, this is the record board. That's the difference. So, uh, if I look at my scope, okay, this is the left channel. Where are we here? That's one. Mm -hmm. And if I go to the right channel over here, this is the one that's this is the side that's noisy. Like that's the input to it. This is the output over here. We see all that noise. Mm -hmm. look at the scope when I stick the probe onto this transistor here. Okay, we're seeing a bit of noise there. We go to the next stage back onto this one. seen a whole bunch of noise on this one as well as this other one over here See all the noise there that's present on that one it's one of these two I think is where our fault is just from the noise the noise floor that uh, we're detecting when I scope uh, this transistor here and this one over here. It's one of these two where the noise is getting in. Let's just try warming this one up again. See what happens. I'm not touching the transistor itself. I'm just holding the iron very close to it so that it's going to put some heat into the casing. It's that one there, I think. 2SA564, it looks like. I wonder if I've got one of those. 2SA564, it's a PNP transistor. Right, these are the two here that I think may be the problem, one of these two. I wonder if I've got a 2SA564. It's just going to be a standard uh, silicon transistor. I might have something that will work in place of that one. Okay, I have a 2N3906. That's a PNP. It's a... Comp it's a, it's a rated at 60 volts. It's so just a general purpose PNP. Let's just pull this one out of this old board and we'll try that one. Because that might do the job. I 
keep old scrap gadget boards just for that reason. For the odd time I might need a transistor out of one. This one's basing is emitter base collector. Now what this one is, is it labeled? Does it show me what it is? I'll have to probably measure it when I take it out. Anyway, we're gonna we're gonna swap. We're gonna swap this transistor right there. And see whether that noise will go away. Just measure the basing on this so I get the, the other one in the correct way. It's a PNP. So let's see what what what, uh, what it is. Meter collector base looks like. Yeah, see? Meter collector base. And my other one is different. It's a meter base collector, so I have to kind of reverse the leads a bit. I have to kind of reverse the lead so that I can go emitter. And collector is the next one. And then base. So it's kind of gonna go in in a line like that. See, it's okay to sub transistors, but you just have to make sure that you get your your polarity correct, otherwise it's going to go boom. You're gonna have a problem, so you have to kind of bend the leaves to orient which way they're gonna go into the into the board. Twist the leads around to try to make them in a line without them shorting out. So we can kind of go in like this.
Okay, transistor's in. Let's turn on the power. No noise. Dolby off. Dolby on. No crackling and popping. I'm going to uh, just put the board back in and we're going to load up a tape and uh, see how it uh, sounds before we put this thing together. Might help if I. That's weird that that happened, right? No power, no power. But there was something enough, something enough power stored in here <laughs> that it uh, operated the solenoid once. Let's turn the power on. Okay, Dolby's off. Dolby's on. You can hear volumes all the way up. No noise. This first track I can't play this because even though it's even though it's a royalty free track, it is um, distributed by Triple Scoop Music that comes as part of an editing package that I purchased a long time ago. And there was some tracks on there and they're royalty free. And it says, yes, you can use these on all your productions, all your private productions, but don't go posting them to YouTube or Facebook or we'll smack you with copyright. Bastards. How can you call it royalty free and provide it as part of studio, it was a video studio that it came with, how can you provide it as royalty free and give it away as part of an editing package saying, hey, you're welcome to use this music all you want on your private slideshows and stuff that you're going to show to your friends or family and maybe display them on a, in a public venue but you can't post them on on social media that is ridiculous if it's royalty free it's royalty free there's no if ends or buts if it's royalty free you can use it anywhere but they have a stipulation in their license that you can't so i won't use any of their music and anything anymore because i've had copyright issues with them and when i disputed it they said go back and read the fine print in your license agreement. I read the fine print of my license agreement and the fine print that I needed a magnifying glass as big as this to read uh, says yeah you can use it you can use our music all you want but you can't uh, you can't put it in something that is going to be available on social media so what's the point if I'm doing a slideshow for somebody that's going to be shown at a wedding or a funeral or something I'm just going to use any music. What does it matter? Who cares about it if it's going to be just shown, you know, in private? You don't need a license for that. Anyway, that's my rant for Triple Scoop Music. Thumbs down to them. Things sounding great. Uh, Dolby on. This tape is not in Dolby, so it's not going to make any difference, but that's where we were getting all the noise before she's nice and quiet now and it plays fine even with it on not that I don't think too many people use Dolby on reel to reel it was kind of a it was kind of an afterthought because the vast majority of reel to reel machines don't have Dolby in fact I don't have any Dolby machines this is the first one I've seen that has it Okay, looks like this thing is, we'll check all the features out here. Pause. Yeah, it looks like this one's ready to go back together. So let's just uh, throw the top on this thing, throw the back on it, throw the base on it, and get it out of here. You know, my work on this got delayed by hours today because I had to stop because of all the uh, all the racket that was going on here today. We're in, we're in a pandemic, but you wouldn't know it from all the activity. Um, neighbor had their lawn cut, 
and all their crap picked up. And then another neighbor had another landscaping company come out and do their grass. I basically shut down the repair on this thing for a couple of hours just because um, I was uh, having to, uh, every time I go to start talking, a lawnmower or something would start up. Either a lawnmower would start up or a leaf blower. I don't know what's more annoying. Both of them are pretty annoying when you're trying to record. And uh, when you're trying to concentrate on what you're doing, when you're, uh, you know, when you're, when you're trying to concentrate, the worst, the last thing you want is uh, something making a whole bunch of noise. There's really nothing worse than, uh, you know, you're working on something and you need to concentrate on what you're doing, especially when you're chasing through electrons, basically. And uh, and there's something making a lot of noise in the background. It's uh, one of the most, most distracting thing. It's... Um, it's like someone who's got a barking dog, right? When you're trying to work or trying to sleep and a neighbor's dog is going I have that problem too I had a neighbor that their dog howls constantly when they go out and leave the dog behind you've heard it on some of my videos in the past oh there we go again there goes another lawnmower at least this one's not directly across the street but today the uh, people across the street had a landscaping company show up and then they no sooner finished and another another landscaping company showed up to do the house next door to them and then another landscaping company came out to do the house next to them. It's like, well, does nobody cut their own lawn around here? It appears that everybody uh, pays somebody else to cut their lawn. Probably why my lawn looks like crap compared to everybody else's because I do my own when I get around to it. A couple more screws to hold the side panel on. And this unit will be ready to go back to its owner. Gotta hate it when people do this. I don't know why people do this. They engrave their social insurance or social security number or driver's license or something into the side of the unit. You know, if you're gonna engrave something, put it on the back. Don't do it on the wood. It really uh, cuts the resale value if you're trying to sell it to someone who's, uh, you know, who is, uh, kind of anal about cosmetics although this one's got a scratch on it but still I'm not a fan of using engravers on equipment where you can see it if you're going to engrave it for identification do it on the back it does just as good on the back as it does on the front someone steals it and the cops find it They'll find the uh, info on the back just as quick as they would if it was on the side. So, Got to go past that track. There we go. It's back together and working. Sounding good too for a uh, what 45 year old machine? 19 say was it 75? So 45 years old. Mine is a little older, mine's a 1973 model. My GX260. 
Sounds good. Now that this tape is very old too, right? This is an old tape. It's just this tape is actually quite badly worn, but it's not a sticky shred problem. So it plays fine on this machine. So if we go over the circuitry, I got the machine playing here in the background. That's what you hear. You hear it playing. So um, if we go over the circuitry here, we'll study this circuit for the Dolby. Looking for my highlighter. Okay, our audio comes in. Our audio comes in here. It's amplified by TR1, where it's passed over to TR2. And it's coupled through through TR3 and to TR4 and through to the output. When the Dolby is switched off, this pin here is grounded. So that shuts this whole circuit out. This is the Dolby circuit here. How the Dolby circuit works is it works by attenuating when there's low levels of, of signal. So you'll notice that um, number C here is connected to uh, D. D? tells me what here. Uh, C and D is for the record, so C and B. So the output here, here's our output. Our output feeds back around and into C. The, the test point D, or, or, or the output D is used to feed back when you're in record mode, because there's two of these boards. There's one board for playback and one board for record. So the signal is fed back and it's amplified by this field effect transistor. Here's our, our circuitry here that determines when it attenuates is in here. There's a reference voltage generated in D2. Uh, our levels are set through VR1 and, or VR2 and VR1. It operates this as an attenuation circuit. So when the, when the levels fall below a certain level, these transistors go into conduction. To turn on the Dolby, we remove the ground from point number E, which allows the circuit to operate. So then what happens is the as the op circuit operates, it modulates this transistor, TR8, and TR8 acts on the output. Uh, where is it here? Um, feeds, there's a feedback loop here created. Right, this is our feedback loop, and the output is actually modulated through, uh, was it TR7? This is the one we changed. This is the transistor that was bad, that was causing all the noise, TR7. Its signal is coupled through this capacitor and back up into the circuitry, circuitry here through this 180K resistor, and that is used to attenuate the audio signal passing through out to the output. That is, uh, and if we look over here onto the main schematic, you'll see that, um, where are we here? The Dolby board is right here. So our output is off, off of pin number C right here, which is connected to B. So this is our, this is our output here as well. Continuing as I had uh, I was interrupted there by the the uh, owner of the tape that came to pick it up um, Okay, our line outs are here and they're connected as you can see to number the C The big C right there that goes to your line out so and of course C and B are connected internally together on the playback one so here we go C and B C is the input here, but it's also the output so this this is your line out. I need a new pen. This is the output. So our input again is here and our output is there and our feedback loop goes around here and feeds into the FET, 
for our noise reduction. Noise reduction takes place by affecting the voltage controlled attenuator, VCA. It uh, is coupled through this capacitor here, so it's, it feeds through, it's amplified, passes in, so our signal goes straight into TR6, through TR6 and TR7, where it's coupled into attenuate the signal, it also passes into TR8, and TR8 is coupled back through through here, through these diodes, resistors, and it goes back into the, the gate of the field effect transistor, which is what controls the FET and the FET balance is controlled through VR2 um, and the gain and over through VR1. This is our network here. This is what controls the attenuation based on the level and the frequency. So it rolls off at frequencies above 10 kilohertz up to 10 dB, but only, only when the signal level is below a certain uh, point. That's the how Dolby works, is it will roll off the uh, attenuator will attenuate when the signal's low, the higher frequencies, uh, the higher frequencies are boosted on record and the higher frequencies are cut on playback. And it's all controlled through this here. And when you turn it off, you're basically just shutting off this circuit and the signal can just pass straight through. And anyway, this transistor here was the one that was uh, causing me the noise. That's the one we changed. It's sounding good now. But without the schematic, I would have never figured that one out. Anyway, thanks for watching, and we'll uh, we'll catch you in the next one real soon. Bye for now.